When former doctors speak out and start criticizing allopathic medicine, all hell breaks loose. The medical quote authorities have come after both myself and my husband Mark in recent years after we went public with the COVID-19 fraud. They can't refute works like Virus Mania or a farewell to virology, so instead they try gag orders and farcical prosecution attempts. We have spent years contributing to the work demonstrating that the virus model is broken and on a wider front, the germ theory model as well. So what about antibiotics? We've all heard the challenges from the germ proponents who claim that we wouldn't dare refuse antibiotics for ourselves or our children in the case of a life-threatening illness that they call an infection. But are antibiotics really life-saving compounds or more mythology from the pharma cartel? This is a huge topic, but let me show you a few of the greatest scientific deceptions surrounding one of the medical establishment's crown jewels. In the year 2000, while working as a first year house surgeon, my husband Mark was on a ward round, being led by a medical consultant. An elderly patient was diagnosed with pneumonia, and the consultant advised Mark to prescribe intravenous antibiotics as per the hospital's drug protocol book. Mark picked up the medication chart, but instinctively hesitated and said to the senior doctor, Why do we always give these? The consultant was incredulous that such a question would come up, but Mark pressed him and asked how he knew they worked. No definitive evidence was offered, and instead the consultant emphatically stated that it was established through decades of collective wisdom and clinical experience. Not only that, but the patient's sputum could be sent to the lab to see which bacteria were present and which antibiotics killed them. Mark could see something was amiss and another seed was planted that led to the eventual departure of both of us from the allopathic medical system. The word antibiotic derives from the Greek anti and bios, which translates to against life. That may give you some clues about the origins of this class of pharmaceutical, which is embedded in germ theory and the war against microbes. Medical students are often taught the famous story of Scottish physician Alexander Fleming, who was investigating the growth of Staphylococcus aureus bacteria on culture plates in London in 1928. One of the culture plates was left exposed while he was on holiday, and when he returned, he realised it was contaminated with a blue-green mould. He then noticed that the bacteria did not grow around the mould, and surmised that a substance that killed bacteria was being secreted by the mould. Fleming called it penicillin and published his findings the following year in 1929, but his paper initially created little interest in the medical community. Dr Howard Florey at the University of Oxford became aware of penicillin in 1939 and approached the British Medical Research Council for funding to investigate its antibacterial properties. His team received only a modest grant, but then an agent from the Rockefeller Foundation stepped in and suggested that Flory, quote, apply for foundation funding. The application mentioned that it may also be pointed out that the work proposed, in addition to its theoretical importance, may have practical value for therapeutic purposes. And hey presto, it was approved by the Rockefeller Foundation. In a 1989 New York Times article titled, Big Money Meets Big Science, it was written that Rockefeller money helped support some of the most profoundly important advances in modern science and medicine, including the work of Niels Bohr, Enrico Fermi, Werner Heisenberg and Hans Krebs. The development of such vital research tools as the ultracentrifuge, the electron microscope and the 200-inch Hale telescope and the discovery of penicillin. Well, apart from Krebs, the rest were theoretical physicists, 
who made models like the virologists do. And as for the research tools mentioned, they haven't delivered on much that improves the lot of humanity or our well-being. So the inclusion of penicillin in there should raise suspicions. The article goes on to state that, as one of the greatest contributions to the war effort, the Rockefeller Foundation supported the Oxford University researchers Howard W. Flory and Ernst Boris Chain while they struggled to transform penicillin from a petri dish curiosity to the miracle drug that saved the lives of millions, including the Allied soldiers who might otherwise have died of the virulent battlefield infection, gas gangrene. Obviously, it is not possible in this video to go through every disease that is claimed to be treated by antibiotics. However, we can go straight to the top shelf and pick one of the alleged greatest victories brought about by their use. So let's take this classic tale that has been promulgated since World War II, the alleged life-saving penicillin that saved scores of soldiers. There must be plenty of evidence for that, right? Before we get to the state of the science, I should point out that gas gangrene is a life-threatening condition, but it is not an infection by invading bacteria as the mainstream claims. If you try to find any evidence that the bacterium Clostridium perfringens can invade healthy tissue and make someone sick, you won't find it. It is a type of bacteria that is found everywhere, often in decaying vegetation, the soil, and even in our gut. In other words, a crucial part of our ecosystem, rather than a pathogen. Conditions like gas gangrene are the result of devitalized muscle tissue brought about by a blocked blood supply, trauma such as gunshots or even snake bites. The microbes will certainly start proliferating, but not until the tissue is already dying, i.e. the underlying terrain has changed. It is like a piece of meat from an animal. Once the blood supply is cut off and the tissue is deoxygenated, the microbes that are everywhere will get to work breaking it down. It doesn't matter if the tissue is still attached to living tissue, the breakdown will proceed regardless. So let's get to the evidence for antibiotics in the case of gas gangrene. In 2015, the Cochrane Group performed a review titled Interventions for Treating Gas Gangrene. They looked for randomized controlled trials that compared one treatment of gas gangrene with another treatment or with no treatment and identified two relevant RCTs with a total of 90 participants with gas gangrene. And the conclusion? Neither trial reported on this review's primary outcomes of quality of life and amputation and death due to gas gangrene or in adverse events. Trials that addressed other therapies such as immediate debridement, antibiotic treatment, systemic support and other possible treatments were not available. The benefits and harms of different treatments for gas gangrene remain unclear as the available trials do not provide high quality evidence due to low sample numbers and a number of problems with the way the trials were conducted that can introduce bias to the results. Pretty underwhelming stuff. In fact, it means that the widespread claim that penicillin saved all those wounded soldiers has no scientific basis. If there was improvement in their outcomes, it was most likely due to surgical removal of dead tissue, awareness of hygiene, and improved practices in managing shock, such as rehydration. You can watch my video, Five Spectacular Fails from Germ Theory, for more information on this. Regardless, in terms of the millions of lives penicillin alone is supposed to have saved, the scientific evidence is lacking. It is a case of medical mythology and pharma marketing spin. But the use of antibiotics is not set to slow down. To add to the lolly scramble, the CDC has recently suggested the use of the antibiotic doxycycline for some people when they have sex to purportedly prevent them getting infections. You can watch my videos such as what we weren't taught about gonorrhea to see why entities such as this are not infections. In any case, apparently the CDC propose getting even more antibiotics into the population, even though they have, quote, wrestled with the concern that doxypep could raise the risk of bacteria developing resistance to the antibiotic. Ah, antimicrobial resistance, another fear-based narrative being propagated on faulty premises. The story has been pushed by mainstream outlets such as The Guardian, who reported last year that 
Antimicrobial resistance poses a significant threat to humanity, health leaders have warned. More than 1.2 million and potentially millions more died in 2019 as a direct result of antibiotic-resistant bacterial infections, according to the most comprehensive estimate to date of the global impact of antimicrobial resistance, AMR. They were referring to a Lancet paper with the title Global Burden of Bacterial Antimicrobial Resistance in 2019, a systematic analysis. Sponsored by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the Wellcome Trust. And how did they come up with the figures? They used predictive statistical modelling to produce estimates of AMR burden for all locations, including for locations with no data. In other words, they made it up. Not only are they using modelling estimates, but the input data itself is phony, as none of the conditions they listed have been shown to be caused by bacteria. So bacteria being resistant to the drugs is not relevant to any individual's cause of death. The paper would be pleasing to Big Pharma though when it concluded that it is crucial to making informed and location-specific policy decisions, particularly about infection prevention and control programs, access to essential antibiotics, and research and development of new vaccines and antibiotics. The pharma-sponsored germ focus results in tunnel vision, where doctors have been led to believe that killing bugs can benefit a patient. This becomes their goal rather than reversing the underlying problems that made the patient sick in the first place. Take the example I introduced at the start regarding the consultant that instructed Mark to prescribe IV antibiotics for pneumonia. In the allopathic model, the condition is said to be caused by bacteria, so a sputum sample is sent to the lab, and if certain microbes are cultured, they take the blame. The lab then tests various antibiotics against the microbes to establish the sensitivities, or which of them kills the bacteria most effectively. The treating doctors are then guided by these results and select one or several antibiotics to give to the patient. There are so many problems with this, and for brevity, we'll list some of the main ones. Number one, the underlying causes of the patient's pneumonia were not established, so were not treated. Number two, the presence of bacteria in a sputum sample is not diagnostic of a disease. The microbes are bystanders that proliferate under certain conditions and healthy people inhale them without ill effect. Three, killing bacterial colonies on a plate with antibiotics is not treating a patient. Even if the antibiotic does kill bacteria inside the person, there is no evidence that this is curative. The last point also raises an interesting question about why antibiotics may work in suppressing symptoms in some conditions. Certain skin diseases and so-called urinary tract infections spring to mind. Many antibiotics do not simply kill bacteria on petri dishes. When they are given to complex organisms such as humans, they act as anti-inflammatory agents. Dermatologists have known about this mechanism for years and have prescribed them extensively for inflammatory skin conditions and what the mainstream call autoimmune disorders. It's an area that is not well publicized as the germ theorists prefer the antibacterial narrative. The flaws in the claims about antibiotics such as penicillin were already anticipated in the pre-antibiotic era. In 1887, British surgeon Lawson Tate noted that I have opened the abdomen in many cases packed full of tubercular matter and drained it like a common abscess and have cured the patients. The same thing has been done by Esmark, who has identified the bacillus in the orthodox German fashion. Does anyone believe that either of us removed every bacillus and every spore? I know I did not, for the tubercular masses in several of my cases kept coming out for weeks afterwards, yet the patients recovered. What I really did was to enable my patients to get rid of the dead or dying exudation on which the bacilli lived, of the decomposition of which they are probably the means and wholly the result. Apply this notion of the germ theory of disease to the facts of clinical medicine and surgery and see how irreconcilable with the facts it is. The reason antibiotics are a scam is that they are based on the wider errors of germ theory. Microbes are not the cause of disease, although they will proliferate in certain conditions. Vitally, there is no war against them. They act precisely in accordance with nature, which is pro-life. Even if it seems unfair at times, 
they are part of the process that allows regeneration of more life. In calling out the fatally flawed premises of germ theory, Lawson Tate remarked that we do not in the least know what life is. We call it vital power and talk glibly about it, though our men of science seem to have neglected it. Pick out an amoeba and watch him. So long as his sloth-like movements go on, he is avoided by his neighbours. But his movements get feeble and very slow, and you will see a paramecium go at him. The movements cease altogether, and presently you will find him riddled with bacteria and bacilli, and soon all trace of him will be lost. Why did his enemies avoid him whilst he was alive? Why could they so easily attack him when dead? I cannot tell you, but it shows that there is an enormous difference between tissue living and tissue dead. Some of the mysteries under the microscope may never be known to us, but they do not need to be, to live in perfect health. When I reflect on my time in the medical system, I saw fingers being reattached by skillful surgeons and tension pneumothoraxes being instantly relieved by chest strains. I did not see anyone that had their limbs or lives saved by antibiotics, but certainly witnessed some nasty adverse effects, including disturbed microbiomes, following even a couple of doses. Only bringing the terrain back to a vitalized state can result in cure, no matter what the condition, and this can be achieved without the pharmaceuticals. If you enjoyed this video, please visit supportdrsam.com 